Let me call her and tell her. That there we go. Oh. We want to welcome you all tonight as we come into our weekly Bible study. We're again on the I am's of Jesus. Moses said when he was going to deliver the children of Israel, who do I say sent me? And this voice comes and it's God and said, tell them I am. All inclusive, complete, everything that is needed, I am. And so we come to the New Testament and Jesus comes along and says, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life which we're studying tonight. Every time he would say, I am, it really unnerved the Pharisees and Sadducees because they said, so you think you are equal to God. And he is trying to tell them that he is. He is uh, sent from God. He is one of the triune gods in human form. And he moved into the neighborhood so that he might reintroduce the life of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God back into humanity. So before we get started, we're going to study tonight, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to go to John chapter 11. Father, what a joy to enter in into this group tonight. Knowing that you, Holy Spirit, are the one who wrote the word of God, you oversee it, you breathe into it life, and I pray tonight that as this word that you've given me will be as clear and as concise as it was in my heart to paper, from now paper to mouth to these people, and I pray God that you'll anoint it. Uh, I know it's anointed, but it will flow freely, and help me communicate in such a way that it accomplishes and says what you told me in my heart. I thank you for this tonight. And we believe that you are the God of now, the God of resurrection. You are God of life. We hate, we ask you to hurry up and get here and come get us so that we can all go home and be with you. This world is progressively every day getting more wicked than the day before. But we know it's in your plan and purpose. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, and then it's kind of long in order for us to get it and understand it, and then 17 through 44. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so the Son of God no, will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. How do you want me to go? On? 17 okay. through 44. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Mary got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you only had been here, my brother would never have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask, Jesus told her. Your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise again when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will leave live even after dying everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die do you believe this martha yes lord she told him i have always believed you are the messiah the son of god the one who has come into the world from god then she returned to mary she called mary aside from the mourners and told her the teacher is here and he wants to see you so mary immediately went to him Jesus had stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him when the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave. So hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep, so they followed her there. 
When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up inside of him, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see, and then Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone away aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for healing me. You always are hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. We come to another I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. This time, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and I am life. Three things I want us to catch in this teaching. Number one, don't miss him. Let me say that again. Don't miss him. Number two, from ashes to life. And number three, restoration of lost things. Lazarus has died and he and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, are very close to Jesus. He has eaten at their house. It records it that in this story that uh, he had eaten at their house. And I assume just because they are very close and great friends, and it's stated through what we read, that Jesus probably made this a frequent stopover. And the relationship between Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, and Jesus was very, very strong. Mary's the one that weeps and over his feet, washes him with her hair, and uh, just a lot of oneness that is there in this family and most likely uh in verse five it says jesus loved them very much so we know that there is a great love that is there lazarus is sick and the sisters send a letter to jesus and said hey lazarus is sick very sick would you come and heal him and jesus instinctively delays and Lazarus dies, and he tells the disciples, he says he's asleep, and then he says, we need to go up to uh, Bethany, and, uh, bar, uh, and they said, the last time we were there, we almost got killed. We don't want to go there, and he said, well, if Lazarus is sleeping, well, then he's getting better, and he said, no, you don't understand. He's dead. Now, the Bible speaks about sleeping, and people have preached and some denominations believe in soul sleep. I don't believe that. Soul sleep means when the person dies, their soul and their spirit stays in the body, in the ground, and doesn't go anywhere. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment you and I take our last breath in this life and take our next one in the next one is our immediate transfer from here to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, or from here into hell, where there is great torment that is going on. And so Jesus said, let's go, because he's sleeping. Verse 11, he finally had to tell him that Lazarus is dead. Now, number one, don't miss him. What do I mean by that? In verses 17 through 44, Martha and Mary and the mourners, Jews, all missed who Jesus was, and is and why he even came. Just like a lot of people miss why he even came to the earth. They didn't see who he was. They thought things about him. They spoke things about him. They saw him do miracles. But until verse 45, some until verse 45, did they see find out that it's for the glory? And then some of the Jews, women there, still not believing after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. Don't miss him. We're going to look at verses 20 through 27. I want to bring this fresh back into your mind again before we go the next step. Just a 
When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will leave, live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. There's two thoughts here, and there's one that Jesus is and trying to relate to humanity. And the other one is the thought of Martha, how that she perceives Jesus, and it needs to be changed. She's, God wants to change her from the temporal to the eternal. She, he wants to open up her eyes for her to see that Jesus is present, and when he's present, everything that is needed is there. And so when she hears that Jesus is on the outskirts of town, he stops there. She runs out to him and she begins to confront him. If you would have been here, he would have never, this would have never happened. She only thought he could handle a problem that was there at the moment. But after the problem had gone away, after the person had died, after they had buried him and sealed the tomb, after four days of death and his body began to deteriorate, there was no thought in her mind that that could be resurrected, that that could be restored. It was a loss until the rapture of the church. And she knew that one day that they would all meet again in the eternals, but she would never see him again. Have, how many of you have ever been there where you have been praying and asking God, to come and redeem a situation, and he doesn't do it, and it all falls apart, and you confront him, and you say, where were you? Where are you? You said you would do this in the scriptures, and I don't see you performing what you said you'd do. I don't, I've prayed, I've fasted, I've sought your face, and everything still seems to be falling apart. Now, Jesus is trying to open her eyes up to see the, the past of the, the parts of the human, and that he is the son of man, but he is the son of God. And he wants her to see the Christ, the son of God, the living one, not the son of God, the son of David. And Martha knows enough about Jesus' capabilities, but not his divinity, his state, his, his uh, qualities, his divine being. I know you could have healed him, but now it's too late. And she had a limitation in her thinking of what Jesus was capable and able to do. And I want to I want to make a shift in your spiritual thinking tonight. I want to I want to plant something in your hearts and your minds that we begin to look over our lives and see the Lord in a brand new way because as we go through this you're going to see there's some things that you have considered dead, gone, and over. And Jesus is here and wants to resurrect certain things in your life. And he wants to bring some things back that are in the purposes and the plans of God that were precious to you too. And so Martha is so like so many believers. They understand Jesus' ability and capabilities and I know the last day you'll raise him up. She was looking for an event, a date when the rapture would take place and Lazarus would be raised up. Most people see Jesus solving a situation, an action, uh, uh, and uh, solving a situation, an action, and it's, and it's a place, it's a time, and it's a thought. He says to her, I am the resurrection of life. I want you to look at her response in verse 27, what does she say? 27? Yeah. Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Okay, I know you've come here. 
And he's trying to get her to understand that he is bigger than the human capabilities that are here. What he's trying to tell her is look beyond Jesus who has come and see the Jesus who I am. I am resurrection and I am life. And I am, uh, I, it, and resurrection and life is only an outflow of who I am. There's never death around me. And, and, and I don't, and I take death and turn it into life. I want you to know you don't, I don't speak resurrection and it comes from somewhere else. I don't speak life and it comes from somewhere else. I am resurrection. I am who raises dead things. I am life when you have been broken and when you have can't see a way out and you are totally overwhelmed with discouragement and disappointment and alone. I am life. When I stand in you, it's like turning on the light and all that begins to dissipate, run for the corners because it's I am who is there. Resurrection should never be a thought of a thing to happen, but it should be a, of a person. We get comfort knowing that a resurrection day is coming, but we, we miss him as the person that is present. And now to that says nothing is over until I say it's over and he is present, hope, and comfort. I want to illustrate this by this. The Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Married or unmarried, when there's a loss in our life, God is looking at us as individuals. We have a lady down the street whose name is Kay. About two years ago, she got a phone call, and her husband was at lunch at a restaurant, and he was eating lunch, and he fell over dead, just, just died at the table. She got a phone call and said, your husband is dead. We didn't know about this. She was very quiet. And I used to see her walk up and down the streets, and I would laugh and talk with her and say hi and whatnot. And it was about a year or a year and a half, about a year later, she began to come out of her house and start walking again. And we had just heard about it because she lived. And, uh, and, I, and, and I started to talk with her and I said, so how are you? And she said, I remember when it first happened, I, I was crying. I didn't know what to do. We'd bought this motor. We had plans to go travel. We were going to do all these wonderful things. And he dropped over dead. And I sat on my back porch crying with my head in my hands saying, Lord, I don't think I can do this. I don't know how to do this by myself. And she said, I was in such a deep funk. I didn't know what to do or what to say. And she said, I just sat there and I began to place myself in the presence of the Lord. And he began to move in my life. And he began to bring resurrected life because he lived in me. He began to push out the discouragement, the depression, the loneliness, the, the feeling of being forgotten, the feeling of being alone. And she said, I'm living again. Resurrection life has come. And then we heard this past week, she's engaged to get married. God has resurrected her. Now, it was his time to go home. I believe that. I believe that every person that dies is murdered, and earthquakes in Turkey, uh, the, girls, the, the four kids that got up in Idaho that were murdered, I believe they've all been in the time frame of God. We don't get to choose how we die. It is us who are living that stays behind have to deal with the loneliness and the hurt and just the, why did they die? But for those that know the Lord, they enter into a presence and they're like the apostle Paul. They've run their race. They finish their course and henceforth is laid up for them a crown of righteousness. They're rejoicing. Now there's two people that both have a call of God on their life. Two people set in the purposes of life. And one of them ran their race and they went home. The other one was here and had depended upon their mate, which they should and they do. 
I, I have sat and thought, I don't, I don't know how I would handle it if something should happen to Judy. I, I, I don't know if I could handle that. But I don't need that grace right now because I'm not walking through it. And people who walk through deep valleys get a grace that is given to them that no one else gets. It's the grace of God. It is the resurrection of life. And God began to take her. And like Martha, she was over. She thought her life was over. She thought there was no more to live for. She didn't know what she was going to do. She saw herself cooped up in this house. She saw herself with no vision, no desire, no goals, no wanting to do anything. And she turned to the Lord. And as the Lord began to walk through the corridors of her heart, her mind, and her life, he began to push that brokenness out and begin to bring life in the midst of death. Because when Jesus shows in that there is no death around him, and she began to breathe again, she began to think again, she began to again, and she began to let love grow again. And God in his infinite wisdom and love, resurrected God, who restores what has been lost, replaces what has been taken, brought a gem to her life that she is so excited about. And I know he's a believer. I've met him. But he's got to be because she's a strong believer. And there, her life is going to live again. She's going to have fulfillment again because she's still running her race and the Lord has not forgotten her. And Jesus is trying to say the same thing to Martha right here. I want you to know, quit looking for uh, something to be done. Look to me. I'm the one that's resurrection. I am the one that is life. I am the one that knows how to give you a new start and restore what's been lost, what's been broken, what's been forgotten. And, and so God has a thought for each one of us individually. And he wants us to have a relationship with him, no matter what happens around us. When loss comes, whether it be through a person or a business or a broken heart, God says, I'm dealing with you specifically, and I want to come and bring resurrection life. Martha, don't miss me. Number two, turn ashes into life. I think so many times that we have gone through loss and brokenness that we just have to just tuck it away, and we live with it, and we live with the memory of pain, and always wondering if we could ever, what it would have been like if, wishing that that whatever that loss was, or why do I have to live with a broken heart? And why has it placed now in that broken mistrust with people and a mistrust with church leadership or <clears throat> whatever the brokenness is there? I want you to look at verses 37 through 42 and look what it says. But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept a Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him, but Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he's been for four days and the smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. These people, Jesus as someone who missed an opportunity to touch Lazarus and save his life if he would have just been here. We must realize that all things work together for good. Our timing must match up to his timing, not the other way around. And Jesus waited four days, why? Verse 40 says, so the glory of God can be exposed. There's always a purpose and a plan of what happens in our lives. Jesus wants to do something, knowing that we live in a world, that in the world you will have tribulation, knowing that in the world the enemy throws fiery darts at you, knowing that in the world is fickle, and no matter who you trust, they 
desperately in time might and could hurt you and break your heart. And Jesus knew these things were all coming about. And so he waits four days that the glory of God could come. And what we consider loss or failure is nothing but a stepping stone to the next level in Christ, because there is never a loss in Jesus. There's never a death. He said, I am the resurrection and life. Look at Isaiah chapter 61, verse uh, three. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. When we go through a problem, there's four things that Jesus says, or Isaiah says that God speaks unto him, that says that, th uh, that are four things that are going to come out of loss. And ultimately, it is a glory to the Lord, and God takes things that look like destruction and turns them for good. Joseph understood this. He meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. There was a reason. Joseph caught it. That's why Joseph endured prison, endured uh, 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 his servants' lies, the, the wife lies that got him in prison. It, it, he endured those things because he knew God was faithful and God had a plan and a purpose. Four things. Number one, it says in Isaiah 61, you get a garment of praise instead of a faint of spirit. And what God wants to show is that in the midst of that loss, when everybody sees what's going on, you don't put a fake on for them. You, you begin to have a true spirit of praise that comes upon you. And people look at you and go, wow, aren't you mourning? Yeah, he's turned my mourning into gold. He's taken my sorrow and turned it into praise. I don't understand how he did it, but he has healed my broken heart. He said in his word, he'd give me a new heart, and he's done that. And so when that begins to happen, people begin to watch you. You'd be surprised how many people watch you because out of your mouth, you profess and confess to be a believer. And they're watching to see if what's inside of you comes out. And when the very things that they go through and you've gone through, but you don't respond the same way, it alters their thinking because there's a garment of praise. Secondly, you're called oaks of righteousness. <laughs> there's a steadiness in you. You understand this, but it's not going to impede my walk with the Lord. I will still praise him. Job said this, yet he slays me, though I will praise him. He's lost everything he owned. He's lost all of his children. And yet God, in the end result of that, because of will not walk away from God. Yes, they have great argument, and he's speaking out of his pain, but out of that, God restores everything back, double, except for his 11 children. He gives him 11 more. Want to know why he gave him only 11 and not 22? Because all of his kids were saved, and they were waiting for him in heaven, and therefore God doubled it, and he had 22 kids. 11 had gone on to be ahead of him. Secondly, thirdly, is you're the planting of the Lord. You grow from it, and you bear fruit from it, and people can glean from you. There's things that we don't understand why God uses us sometimes as object lessons. Lazarus was an object lesson. Martha didn't see it. Mary didn't understand it. Jesus knew it, and he said, look unto the Lord. See what God wants to bring out of this. Can you imagine how many people came to know Jesus out of Lazarus' death? Fourthly, it says, so that God may be glorified. Your life is a canvas that God paints life on it and shows the world all about his goodness, his favor, his restoration, his resurrection to you. Whether it looks like you were down for the count, like Job, <clears throat> you must begin to realize that you're never out. You're never down. You may be down for a moment. The Bible says the righteous will be thrown down one time and rise up seven. We're never kept down. And when we understand that God is in resurrection life, and some of you right now are going through some deep waters and you don't know where God is, you don't know what's going on, you don't understand, I'm telling you right now, 
God has a plan and a purpose, and what he wants you to do is begin to allow him to resurrect hope in you, resurrect love in you, resurrect a new idea in you. You don't want to try again. You, you're afraid to do anything, and that's not God. God is going forward. He doesn't stop. He's not stale. He's moving forward, and God wants to do that for you right now, and what you do is you say, Father, I, I'm just needing you right now to come into my life, and I will trust you with a new thought. I will trust you with a new hope. That's what Kay did down the street. She began to turn away from the death of her husband to the resurrected life of Jesus. She didn't focus on what has happened. She focused on who is happening. She began to see God do things in her life that was there. And Jesus is trying to explain to Martha and Mary, that's me. Don't look and see what you visualize or seeing. See what I want to do in resurrected life in you. And so uh, he comes and in verse 44, he says, you he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out. And this is really good. He was bound and they had wrapped him up. Jesus doesn't go over there and unwrap him. <clears throat> you know what he said? You go unwrap him. You wrapped him. You bound him up. You put him in the hole. You rolled the rock over the cave and you go and loose that. It's the same what people have done when they've been hurt. They've wrapped it up in a bandage. They put it in a cave. They've rolled a stone across the front of it and said, I'm never going there again. I'm never trusting again. I'm never loving again. I'm never hoping again. I'm never going in that again. That hurt was too deep. It was too bad. And I put it in there. And Jesus, when he calls forth Lazarus, he comes hopping out of there. And he said, you bound him. You didn't have enough faith to believe that God could do that, that what I have just done. You let him go. You roll the stone back. You take off the bandages and you set him free. And Jesus is saying, uh, uh, he's saying, I'm not waiting till the rapture. He said, and, and do not uh, wait until rapture of death. Why? Because Jesus rolled the stone away. He takes off the binding so that you, so I can turn it into praise. And this is exactly what God wants to do. He wants you to go into your life where you have rolled a stone over something you have hidden that is back in the back of your mind that has loss and pain still to it. And he wants you to give him the opportunity to roll the stone. He wants you to open the stone. He told them, roll the stone back. He didn't do any of this. All he does is shout and command Lazarus to come forth. And God is asking you and I in obedience, if you want to see my healing, if you want to see my praise, if you want glory to be given to God, I want you to roll the stone back. And I want you to keep ask that thing that's been in that tomb. It's <coughs> so hard to handle, so heartbreaking. You've gone back there from time to time to visit this grave, and it just has broken your heart. I want you to come now and I want you to call that out so I can take ashes and turn it into life. I can take what smells and turn it into a sweet fragrance of aroma unto me. So I can turn it into praise and I can, I can return the ashes back to its former life that it's whole and healed again. That's God's plan for your life. Don't wait until you get to heaven and say, when I get to heaven, he'll heal my heart. When I get to heaven, he'll make it all right. When I get to heaven, he'll adjust, he'll, he'll adjust what was wrong. That's not God's plan. That's what Mary and Martha thought. When we get to heaven, it'll all be better. But right now, he's dead. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection now. Lastly is the restoration of lost things. Nothing is lost in Jesus. Nothing is ever, nothing in God's plan goes unfulfilled. God always fulfills what he purposes in his heart 
for his purposes, and he always fulfills what he purposed for you in your heart. Now, there are people, all people feel that when they stand before the Lord, they want to, they have this thought, I wonder if I've done enough, where he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or would he look at me and say, what did you do with what I gave you? Where were you? Why didn't you do that? He will never, ever chide you when you stand before him, ever. His love is too great. Well, what about the purposes of God that didn't get fulfilled? What about the, the voice that God spoke to me and I, because of fear, whatever, didn't obey that? I'm telling you, Jesus will look at you and, and say, I love you. Now, catch this. When we stand before God at the judgment seat, he will never judge you and I for sin. You will never hear him say, open a book and say, this is the sin you did. The judgment seat that the Christians are going to go to is the judgment seat of rewards. It, now, here's what will happen. He will reward you according to your efforts that you have followed him. And what he's going to do is place Christians in the servanthood lineup. He said, because you've been faithful over little, I'll make you uh, ruler over much. There are some people that are going to get there with the smell of smoke on them. They didn't do anything for God, but they're there. They missed all the purposes of God. They never fulfilled anything God wanted them to do. And when they get there, they won't have anything to show for their life. But they're there, and God loves them, and God is glad that they're there. So what about all the failures, the missed opportunities, and the, 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 the missed purposes of God? God says, I'm telling you, what I'm going to do now is I am going to restore back through you the purposes of God that you missed. Because every purpose I had, every purpose I had for you will go and be fulfilled. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 29. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance, meaning that God has called you, and you can't ever repent from that. He called me to pastor. I can't stop but not pastor. Now, in Revelations, it says that he's going to have kings and priests. We're going to read that in a minute. And so those that are priests in this life will be priests in the next one. Those that have been in the workplace, those that have been doing what they've done by not being behind the pulpit are going to be kings. And they're going to rule over cities. They're going to rule over People, they're going to be rulers as kings. Now, hear me. When we stand before Christ and are judged as believers, it's never for sin that that price has been paid for. It's a judgment of rewards. And our placement in the rank and file of God's servants is what's going to happen at that judgment. But what's going to happen is God is going to say, I have some wonderful, unfulfilled purposes for you for myself and for you also. And now I am going to bring them about with no restraints. So what has been missed? What has failed to take place? God has it written down and he's gonna come back and fulfill it through you in the next dimension. We're going to live for forever. We're going to rule for forever. And what we didn't get done here, we're going to take it on the road there. Now look at Revelation chapter 1, 5 through 6. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. King James says kings and priests. We will help run the universe and care for the people living outside the city of New Jerusalem. And we will run as priests and kings and be, be those that will teach the way of God to those that are there. And as a result of that, we will know his voice. 
We will have no fear of retribution. We will have no fear that uh, we may not be able to do it. We will walk in a power that is we don't even know about. And the very purposes that God has planned for us, through us, and to us will be fulfilled in us. And we will begin to now restore what has been lost. And it's a restoration of God's purposes. So when you sit here tonight and you're thinking, man, I should have done that. I, I, I didn't get that done. I hope he's not going to be displeased with you. He's not. What he's going to do is said, we're going to take it up. You and I are going to fulfill what you didn't get done in this life. And we're going to do it in the eternals. Now, you may have a lesser position there, but you're still going to be happy because you're in heaven. But the thing that God is really looking for, and you say, well, I'll just sit back and rest then if I'm going to make it. No, listen, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a dishwasher in the kitchen. I want to be out doing things. And so we begin to have an attitude that we want to work for the Lord and do everything he's called us to do. Well, Rick, I'm at the end of my life. Me, I'm 71 years old now. You start, you begin to start where you're at and the mercies of God will begin to work through you like you've never done before. And we can never disappoint God. He's never disappointed with you or with me because he loves us. He tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, meaning you and I must determine our station in the ranks of and file of the servanthoods of God when we get there to the saints. And part of that, Jesus said, I'm coming, I'm bringing my rewards with me. And I'm telling you that if you want to be rewards, well, Pastor Rick, well, I thought we're not supposed to work for work, uh, do good works for God. No, we're not. But we're supposed to be obedient. Jesus said, if you, you visited me in prison, or you, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. All of those things are things that God has told you and I to do. Or, or you go down the street and, and God speaks to you about helping that neighbor mow their grass or do something. And that was a God thing. You did, you're not looking for anybody to pay you back. You just did what the Lord told you to do. And as a result of that, those are things that he rewards you because you've been obedient to the word of God and to the voice of God. So I want you to throw cross into the wind. I want you to hear his voice and I want you to follow him because he's resurrection and he's life that is in him and he lives in you and he wants to be lived out through you. And if you don't go, he can't be released. If you don't go where, you're, where he wants you to go to meet people, he can't touch those people because he's limited to do his ministry in and through you. I had to go to the doctor yesterday and they had to do a sonogram on me because I, uh, my doctor, I guess, thought I had an aneurysm. So they rubbed this jelly on me and then took that, what they do for women when they're pregnant, and did this sonogram and took a picture of me on the inside. And every one of the girls that I met, the girl that I met when I signed up my paperwork, the girl that I went in and worked on, worked on me and one that was walking down the hall, I just took the liberty and said, you know, Jesus coming soon. Do you know him as your personal savior? And do you have a reservation there? And they looked at me and they go, yes, I do. And I said, great, because I don't want anybody to miss out on the Lord. You've got to know the Lord. I got a haircut today. Of course, you know how quiet I am when I speak. And there was this couple sitting there and I started talking to them about the Lord. And I was looking over and one of the ladies who was cutting hair stopped. And she was just sitting there focused on me listening. And I thought, okay, here we go. And I thought, I am not going to miss an opportunity to share the goodness of God. You don't like me, big deal. But if what I said turns your life around and you stand in the portals of glory because of that few moments of conversation, Hallelujah. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. Last scripture, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. 61. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. I think that's 61. I'm sorry. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Got to go back. 
It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple for to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed for I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. I hear the spirit of the Lord as I was writing this to say this to y'all and wherever this tape will go. I'm touching your life. And I want to bring fulfillment in the place where there's been loss and pain, where the stone has been rolled over the entrance. And I'm placing fresh fire in you. And I'm taking your ashes and I'm going to turn them into resurrected life. And then they will be used for doors of opportunity that I want you to do and I want you to go. And I want you right now in your mind's eye or in your heart, I want you to be committed because the Holy Spirit's coming. He's already told me. He's going to come to you and he's going to point things out where you have rolled stones over the cave inside of your heart, your mind, your emotions, where there's been divorce, where there's been rejection, where there's been loss, where there's been pain untimely deaths, whatever has been there. And the Lord is saying that I want you to roll the stone back so that I can give a shout for that that has been destructive to come out that you thought would never be healed, never be restored, never be freed in you again. And he said, I want to breathe life into that. And I want you to take off the bandages of bondage that you've placed on it so that I can make you free again. I want you to trust me. I want you to believe in me. I want you to allow resurrection life to come in to you. Jesus, we just thank you for tonight. We ask you, Lord, that you would just take this word as simple and at times confusing, and I ask you to bring it life to those that are listening tonight, that you want to bring their lives afresh and anew. We don't want to miss you, Lord. We don't want to wait until we get to heaven. We, want to, we don't want to miss the opportunity in the now life that we can live again. We can hope again. We can trust again. We don't want to, Father, we, we want you to take the ashes of things that missed opportunities or pain and stuff in our lives, and we want you to breathe on it. And give us a fresh new start right where we're at and that we don't feel a failure anymore in parts of our lives. We have hope. We trust again. We run again. We speak again. We walk with boldness again. And Father, I just pray right now that you'll restore what's been lost in the lives of people. God, take what seems like that's over. I've, I've moved on, but Jesus, you haven't moved on. There's still purposes that need to be fulfilled. And there's never too late, never too late. Father, I thank you for these people that the enemy has tried to put guilt on them, that they're not good enough. They've not done enough. They've not accomplished enough. They blew it. They turned their back on you, Jesus, and went out in the world and did their thing and then they've come back and they have full life of regrets. Jesus, your attitude is you're home, you're restored, and I love you. 
And I want to take the things that you gathered in your brokenness, and I want to heal them. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right.